Hi, my name's Mark Johnson, and today I want to talk about technology and thinking as part five of my course in thinking about education and technology. The, we have now experiences with technology which are truly amazing. Um, I just want to show you very briefly a, a very quick video of people using the uh, Oculus Rift, which is a vir virtual reality headset. Uh, just have a look at this. Oh, 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 you know, the reaction of people is quite palpable. They say, you know, wow, this is amazing, coolest thing ever, this will change everything. There's been so much reaction on the internet about the impact of this particular technology. And then people get excited and they say, we, we've got to invest in this technology. Yes, this is going to change everything. We've, we've got to get, you know, do what everybody's doing. Now, what happens there is what I want you to think about. Because we have the intervention. The intervention is in the middle there where people are shown some new technology which changes them. Now, before they see that intervention, they have a certain set of expectations about the way the world is, about things that are likely to happen, about the way that they organise themselves, the way they should think about their own professional development, all sorts of a set of expectations. And after the intervention, after they've been shown something really cool like the Oculus Rift, their sets of expectations completely change. Everything that they expected to happen before they were shown the technology is kind of all thrown up. And if it's not rejected, then it's certainly transformed by whatever it is that they, they na they've now experienced as suddenly becoming possible. And it's this way in which technologies can change our expectations about the world which I really want to focus on in this, in this particular presentation and what I really want you to think about as you think about the technologies which are important to you. How can we explain the way that technology shapes our experience? Well, in order to do this, we need to understand a number of things. For example, we need to understand the conditions for being changed by technology. We need to understand the capabilities or the disposition of an individual and their susceptibility to being changed by technology. We need to understand how we perceive what a technology might do for us. And we need to understand how we are shaped by the opinions of others when, for example, you might not like a particular technology but all your friends suddenly start using it and eventually you change your opinion about it. So what we're really talking about is the way that technology changes the structure of society, changes the way that societies, people, organise themselves. We've seen this happen many times. We've had the rise of mobile pho phones, email, texting. Why do these things happen? And how many technologies don't get off the ground? Why don't they get off the ground? So here's a way of thinking about this, uh, drawing on the relationship between social structure and agency. Uh, as it's explained by um, a number of contemporary sociologists. Basically the idea is that agency, which you can, can think of as the things that individuals do, the things that groups do, reproduces and transforms social structure, and social structure conditions and constrains agency. And what I've got here is a guy with a mobile phone. This is someone who's bought a mobile phone right at the beginning of mobile phones, and a red guy is saying to him, well, who are you going to call? And the blue guy thinks, I'm actually uh, not sure. I have to say this was my experience when I first got a mobile phone in the mid-90s. But then um, a, a green person comes along and says, actually, you can call me. I think they're cool too. And I have some friends who you can call too. And um, the idea is, well, there are lots of these green people in this social structure. And some of those green people are friends of the blue person. So gradually you see a transformation of the social structure in terms of people having access to this technology. And 
Then we've got a new red person coming in saying, can I join in? And me, and so there's another one coming in. So the first red person who was initially skeptical has to think to himself, well, my friends are getting phones. Maybe I should get one too. And so maybe he goes off to the phone shop. So let's send him to the phone shop. And he comes out and what's happened he's got one now, what's happened is that the social structure has been transformed by the technology because the ways that people communicate have increasingly started to embrace this particular technology and so that if you want to remain part of the social structures that you were part of before the technology came along you have to adopt new technology practices in order to effectively maintain the status quo of your relationship with all your friends. Uh, to, to sort of reinforce this, you can only think how awkward it is now to maintain your friendships without a mobile phone. Now, because technological change can sometimes produce social change, we sometimes make the error of thinking that if we make technological interventions, social change will follow. This has been very common in educational technology, and here I have a diagram of a uh, interoperability standard called uh, learning design. And learning design basically envisaged a particular technology which would categorize the actions of different stakeholders in education within roles, and the actions of people acting within different roles would work with each other to produce desirable learning experiences. Now, there's something very naive about this, and of course the technology didn't work. In the minds of the people who developed this technology, there was a sort of social utopia where this technology would lead to a better education system in their view. But of course in the reality, it didn't happen. A similar kind of um, intervention is shown here where people have thought about the ways technologies within institutions can interoperate and all the processes of institutions can work together in a very smoothly organised technological flow uh, to produce, again, very efficient, very effective institutions. Once again, real life is much messier than this. Now, the critical perspective on these kinds of interventions is to say, well, in whose interests is it that the kind of technological changes ushered in by these kinds of interventions, in whose interests are, are those made? And it's difficult to escape the conclusion that the people who stand to gain most out of this are the people who dream up the technical systems. Um, but it's not just them, because there are other people who are in power who use technological systems as means of gathering information and having greater control over what goes on in an institution. And only recently we've seen the role of the National Security Agency in the United States in basically spying on the data that Google and Microsoft and Facebook and everybody else collects about us. Now this is important because it raises questions about human freedom and the role of technology, um, indeed the essence of technology. Now, the photograph I have here, this rather forbidding looking man, is, is a philosopher called Martin Heidegger. And he argued about 70 years ago that the essence of technology is what he called enframing. He argued that technology was a way of being, that it that was the dominant way of being in the world today, that our lives are lived in a technological way. Now basically, Heidegger had a view of life which was far richer than any life that we can ever possibly see through using technologies. Effectively, what technologies do, he argued, was to frame a certain aspect of reality and exclude other aspects of reality which it couldn't, it couldn't handle. The part of reality that it allowed us to see was the part that we could find ways of exploiting. So technology basically framed that which we can exploit. Heidegger was very concerned about this and he argued that we need to explore an alternative way of being and he saw that the 
people who had a different way of looking at the world were artists and particularly poets and he felt that the activity of a poet was always to be fully open to the real world, the, the full richness of the world and not to be um, seduced by the frame of technology which only allowed them to see that which could be exploited. Um, and so Heidegger really situates a sort of an opposition almost between the technological way of being and a, a more poetic and artistic way of being. There is a question about whether Heidegger is right. We have to ask ourselves whether modern technology is so very different from earlier technology. If you look at the flint axes that um, Stone Age people used, or the extraordinary um, industriousness of the ancient Romans or the ancient Greeks, um, is our technology any different? Well, Heidegger would say no, not really, because all technologies in frame. But at the same time, there is a level of scale at which uh, technologies like Google and Facebook are um, changing the ways in which we go about our everyday life. To what extent does big data make a difference? To what extent does the fact that there are these big corporations that are collecting huge amounts of data about virtually everything that we do? What, what is the issue there? Is that an issue about politics or freedom or about technology? But then there are also questions about technology itself because some technologies, in fact some of the earliest technologies that ever existed are, are musical instruments. And I've got a little picture here of a medieval musical instrument called a hurdy-gurdy. Do musical instruments in frame? What about toys and teddy bears? Are they technologies? So there is a question about the nature of a technology. Now what I want you to do this week is I want you to use a webcam or your mobile phone or a camera or any other method to make a short video of a room where you spend a lot of time. As you move the camera around, identify the technologies which are important to you. Ask yourself what isn't technology in your opinion. There are maybe things that you see around you which you think aren't technology and ask yourself how your life would be different without the technologies that you consider to be important to you. Okay, so I only do this for about two minutes and I'd like you to post your video either to YouTube, if you don't want it public you can make it an unlisted video, stick it on Dropbox or Google Drive, wherever you want to put it and send me a link. Okay, thank you very much, I look forward to your videos.